stated, quote, at the park, there'd be videos of him trying to fight people with boxing gloves, end quote. Towards the end of his employment there, it was reported that Salvador even said he was going to, quote, shoot up the Wendy's, but none of his co-workers ever took him seriously. However, after a while, this odd behavior got him fired. So that was the second job he was fired from simply because he couldn't get along with people. And from there, Salvador would occasionally work with his grandfather who owned an air conditioning business. But he only did that occasionally and he definitely didn't care about the job. And because he still lived at home, he didn't have any bills or real world expenses he had to save up for. So all of the money he got from Whataburger and Wendy's went towards buying guns and ammunition. It's also around this time when he began telling his friends that he was, quote, saving for something big. He seemed to be ambiguous with these comments, but he did make it known that one day he would be famous. Salvador Ramos was exhibiting a ton of red flags that would go unnoticed. By the end of 2021, he purchased a red dot sight, rifle slings, shin guards, and body armor. Now, it's important to note that he was only 17 years old, so legally, he could not purchase guns himself. But he did ask at least two people to buy guns for him, including his older sister, who refused. Documents provided by the committee stated that family members and friends were aware that Salvador was trying to purchase guns, even though he wasn't of age. And as 2021 came to an end, Salvador's alarming behavior only intensified. At that point, he was even more involved on the streaming platform Yubo, and it's there where his online friends started referring to him as Yubo's school shooter. And even when he played video games, his friends referred to him as the school shooter. It eventually became an ongoing joke for people who interacted with him online, and you don't get a name like that out of nowhere. It's clear that Salvador was alluding to the fact that he was capable of a school shooting, amongst other disturbing comments he would make. On Yubo, Salvador went into a chat room and said, quote, everyone in this world deserves to get raped, end quote. And that was just one of the many rape comments he made on their website. One girl, 19-year-old Amanda Robbins, who lived in California, said that she interacted with him on Yubo and he started making sexual advances. Then, when she turned him down, he threatened to, quote, break down her door, rape, and murder her, end quote. Following this, Amanda reported his account to Yubo and blocked him, but somehow, she continued seeing his username on different live streams. Yubo also told her that if she saw anything else like that to report it, but for whatever reason, his account continued to stay up on their website. And this wasn't the only instance where Salvador said threatening things like this. On February 14th, 2022, at 9.48 p.m., he sent a message to a 17-year-old user. Hey, I worship you. Want me to? Are you a celebrity now? The 17-year-old wasn't interested in his advances, so she didn't respond. And when he realized that she read the message and ignored it, he sent her another message. Go jump off a bridge. The girl was understandably disturbed by the aggressive comment, and she thought it would be best to just ignore him altogether. This guy was clearly unhinged, and she didn't want to entertain it. But that wouldn't stop him from harassing her. Somehow, in the weeks after this, Salvador was able to get the girl's real name and phone number. And from there, he started texting her threatening messages. Hi, are you going to ask how I got your number? Answer me. You're under regret not doing what I say. Biggest op here. Smiley face. The biggest op was his username. So as soon as the text came through, she knew exactly who it was. This girl, just like the one before, would also report his account for harassment and hate speech, but she said she only received automated replies, and again, his account was not banned. Then in April of 2022, another girl would get harassed. 18-year-old Hannah lived in Ontario, Canada, and one day, Salvador messaged her threatening to shoot up her school 
rape her and then murder her and her mom. Again, she would report his account to Yubo, but in response, his account was only temporarily banned. And just days later, he was back to live streaming and harassing women, which is absolutely unacceptable. If members of this website are consistently threatening to rape and murder people, their account should be permanently banned, no exceptions. But sadly, that wasn't the case. Now, apparently, when Salvador would make these threats to women, other people in the live stream would stand up for them and say things like, Get the fuck out of here, you weirdo. These girls don't want you. Leave them alone. One member reported, I'm not going to lie, he was bullied on the app. It's almost a high school community. There are losers, there are popular people there. It's weird to explain. Like when he would join lives, most people would say, you both school shooter, because he was known as being weird. A school friend of Salvador's named Santo Valdez Jr. told CNN that one day while he was at the park, Salvador showed up with these deep cuts all over his face. And when asked what happened, Salvador said that his cat scratched him. However, a few months later, it was revealed that he actually cut his own face, quote, just for fun. He admitted to Santos that he had used knives to cut his face over and over again. Now, who knows which story is true, but it was reported that the cuts did not look like cat scratches. But nonetheless, it was clear that Salvador enjoyed being an outcast. His former classmates admitted, quote, the people that did try to give him a chance to be friends with, he scared them away. He was a bully, really. If you didn't give him what he wanted, he was a bully to you." End quote. In his isolation, Salvador continued to post online. He even posted a wish list on one of his social media accounts that showed which automatic rifles he wanted to purchase. Then on TikTok, he posted videos of himself punching walls, wearing his boxing gloves. He also declared that he could fight anyone, and he even encouraged people to do so. It was obvious by looking at his social media that he was one of those people who tried really hard to look tough. He thought it was cool to post videos of himself fighting, harming animals, egging cars, shooting people with BB guns, but his attempts at looking tough really missed the mark. Not that I should even have to say this, but if you're posting that kind of stuff online, you don't look cool. In reality, you're just screaming that you're an insecure person, which is exactly what he was. In early 2022, Salvador also openly posted about his volatile relationship with his mother, Adriana. At one point, he even live-streamed a huge argument he had with her that started because she disconnected their Wi-Fi. Now, on this live-stream, many of his family members listened in, and the argument got so intense, the police were called to their home, but no arrests were made. And according to Adriana's live-in boyfriend, 62-year-old Juan Alvarez, fights like this were extremely common. Salvador was very disrespectful to his mother, and their fights usually ended in him punching holes in the walls. According to Juan, Anytime he would try to sit down and talk to him about it, Salvador would just stare at him, never uttering a word, and then get up and walk away. Juan would later say, he was kind of a weird one. I never got along with him. I never socialized with him. He doesn't talk to nobody. When you try to talk to him, he'd just sit there and walk away. Now, this fight, the one that was live streamed, seemed to be the final straw for Adriana. And afterwards, she kicked Salvador out of the house, and he was forced to go live with his grandmother. Unfortunately, Salvador's grandma lived just a few blocks away from Rob Elementary School. So every day, Salvador, who was full of hatred, would drive by the school with horribly disgusting thoughts running through his head. Now, interestingly enough, while he was estranged from his mother, Salvador would actually start talking to his father again. Throughout his life, they never really had a good relationship and Salvador had resentment towards his dad for not being around. He was even known to tell people that his father didn't love him. So it's clear that this was a big internal issue he struggled with. Now, even though his dad had been coming around more, 
It just wasn't enough to heal the brokenness, heal the brokenness within him. And like we mentioned, at this point in our story, Salvador was now living with his grandmother, and it was not a great situation. In fact, Salvador didn't have a room to himself, so he was having to sleep on the ground in the living room. And according to his cousin, he started talking about how he was tired of living. They ended up having a heart to heart, and it was clear that Salvador was suicidal. His cousin even talked him out of it. But unbeknownst to everyone, Salvador Ramos had been plotting something far more destructive than killing himself. He wanted to commit a school shooting at the elementary school a few blocks down, and he was just months away from carrying it out. Starting in February of 2022, Salvador started making purchases for the mass shooting. According to the ATF, he bought 60 30 round magazines, a holographic weapon sight, and a Hellfire Gen 2 snap-on trigger system. Now, he was still only 17 years old, so he wasn't old enough to purchase a firearm just yet, but he did do a ton of research on AR-15s, including what type of ammunition was needed, whether or not you could reuse an empty magazine, and also a specific type of juggernaut armor, which is a fictional type of armor that's used in video games. Then, on March 23rd, a suspicious person wearing all black was caught on security camera at Robb Elementary School. This person was never fully identified, but they were carrying a backpack, and it seemed as if they were canvassing the school. And after walking around the school for a while, in the video, the person just leaves. Again, authorities couldn't say with 100% certainty that it was Salvador, but it did seem to match his description. And given what he would later go on to do, it's pretty safe to assume that it was most likely him. While Salvador was planning the mass shooting at Robb Elementary, he continued to speak with people online. And keep in mind, his old high school classmates were still in school at the time. In fact, they were seniors in high school, just months away from graduating. Meanwhile, Salvador had dropped out and didn't have much going for him. But his old classmates were also concerned about his behavior. In March of 2022, a boy he went to school with messaged him saying, quote, people at school talk shit about you and call you school shooter, end quote. Which is always something that I find wild about mass shootings. It seems as though every time one occurs, everyone that knows the shooter always says that they saw it coming that they are the type of person that would do something like that. Sometimes in school shootings, people can even guess exactly who did it without even seeing the shooter themselves. In Salvador was no different. The people that knew him knew that he was capable of mass destruction. In fact, he was straight up telling people that he was going to commit a school shooting, but still nothing was done about it. On April 2nd, 2022, Salvador had the following conversation with someone on Instagram. Are you going to remember me in 50-something days? Probably not. Shrugging emoji. Hmm. All right, we'll see you in May. The thumbs up emoji. In another online conversation, Salvador told a friend that he was going to be famous and that what he planned... Quote, be all over the news. But again, no authorities were alerted. Then in late April, there was another online conversation that alluded to the fact that Salvador had already picked out a date for the mass shooting. Here is how that conversation went down, and I will play the part of the friend. I'ma probably go out to Uvalde in the summer. We should link. Damn, why are you coming here? If it's before May 23rd, I'm down. To visit you. If I get a car by then. Probably go in July or August. Damn, that's too late. I'm about to get two ARs. Wanna see? On May 14th, 2022, he sent a direct message to someone that said, quote, 10 more days. The person would later admit that they figured Salvador was going to, quote, shoot up a school or something or even, quote, commit mass murder. But still, no authorities were notified. Then on May 17th, a 
A friend messaged him saying that people were going around, quote, telling everyone you shooting up the school, end quote. So as you can see, people were talking about it. And Salvador loved the attention. On May 16, 2022, Salvador would turn 18 years old, meaning he was finally of age to purchase a firearm and all the ammunition he wanted. Now, although he wasn't working at the time, he had saved up all of his money he earned from working at Whataburger and Wendy's, and used it at an online Georgia retailer called Daniel Defense, and it's there where he ordered 1,740 rounds of 5.56 millimeter 75 grain boat tail hollow points to his doorstep at a cost of $1,761.50. He also ordered a Daniel Defense DDM4 V7, an AR-15 style rifle, for shipment to a gun store in Uvalde at a cost of $2,054.28, including tax and a transfer fee. And just as a little reminder to anyone listening, especially our young listeners, if you ever see anyone online alluding to anything like this, even if you think they're joking, tell someone. There are countless stories out there of mass shooters saying things like this online, and so many people see it and they don't say anything. And I'm sure these people are filled with regret afterwards that they didn't tell the police. So just as a rule of thumb, even if you don't think someone is serious, report it. And from there, if the police decide that they're not going to do anything about it, that's on them. But at least you did your part. And the world is too dangerous to ignore these types of red flags. So please, if you ever see someone online saying anything even remotely close to this, call your local police department so that they can keep an eye on these sorts of people. In the town of Ubalde is a gun store called Oasis Outback, which is located about 10 minutes away from Salvador's grandma's house. And on May 17th, the day after his birthday, Salvador stops by and purchases a Smith & Wesson M&P 15, which is a rifle he bought for $1,081.42. Then the day after that, he went back to the gun store and bought 375 rounds of M193s and a 5.56mm 55 grain round with a full metal jacket. Now, I'm not sure how Salvador got to the gun stores on these occasions, considering he didn't have a car or a driver's license. I'm assuming he walked or got a ride. But on May 20th, he got word that the rifle he purchased online had been delivered. So he asked his uncle for a ride. He apparently didn't want to be walking around holding a rifle because it would raise some red flags. So his uncle drove him there, but he didn't tell his uncle he was picking up a gun. You see, directly next to the gun store is a popular barbecue restaurant. And that morning, Salvador had been going on and on about how he was in the mood for some brisket. So later that day, his uncle drove him over to pick up some food to go while he waited back in the car. However, not long after when Salvador returned, he wasn't carrying a plate of brisket. Instead, he was holding a long dark box with a rifle inside. Now, according to the committee, quote, the uncle said he did not see what was in the attacker's package and he was too unfamiliar with firearms to know what might have been inside. It is known that the package contained the second more expensive rifle used in the shooting, end quote. And while Salvador was in the gun store that day, he also had the staff install the holographic sight on the rifle. Now, he likely made multiple trips to the store so that he wouldn't raise suspicion buying it all at once. And it seemed to work. The owner of the gun store would later say that he was a, quote, average customer with no red flags or suspicious conditions, end quote. For Salvador's background check, everything was clear. He didn't have a criminal record, and there was no history of mental illness. So the store owner had no reason not to sell him the gun. 
Now, the owner did apparently ask Salvador how he was able to afford all of this, and he responded that he had been saving up his work money. However, later on, customers that were inside of the store said that there was something off about Salvador's presence. Not only was he kind of nervous and fidgety, but he was also dressed in your stereotypical school shooter attire. They would later say, quote, and looked like one of those school shooters, end quote. Another customer said he gave off bad vibes. There was also CCTV footage from inside of the store, and video shows him grabbing the gun from the employee and aiming it off in the distance. Of course, this is pretty normal when people buy a gun, but it is eerie that when he did this, he was practicing his aim for when he would shoot up Rob Elementary. Now, according to the Gun Control Act of 1968, the ATF must be notified of multiple gun purchases, specifically when there are two or more within five consecutive business days. And they do this to make sure people aren't gun trafficking. But the local Uvalde Police Department would only be notified of a handgun purchase. Therefore, Salvador's purchases would be alerted to the federal ATF and not the local sheriff. So the Uvalde Police Department had no idea about the new 18-year-old in town buying several rifles. But after successfully purchasing his weapons, Salvador attempted to store them at his grandmother's house. However, he would quickly run into trouble because she didn't want them there. So Salvador had to come up with a plan. He ended up storing one of the rifles at his uncle's house and the other he hid somewhere outside of his grandmother's home. But now that he had the weapons he would use in the mass shooting, all he had to do was wait for May 24th, 2022. In the meantime, he would continue to speak with people online about his recent purchases. Here is one conversation. Just spent 1652 on ammo and 2150 on some AR. Shake my head. Skull emoji, laughing face emoji, giving me school shooter vibes. Now, 10 days before the Uvalde school shooting, on May 14th, 2022, another horrific mass shooting took place in Buffalo, New York, at the Topps Friendly Markets, where 10 people were murdered by a racist man targeting black people. And days after it, on May 19th, Salvador spent some time Googling about the mass shooting. It's also on that day where he played Roblox with his cousin's young son. Believe it or not, that child actually went to school at Rob Elementary, and Salvador used that opportunity to ask his young cousin about their school schedule, including specific details about lunch periods and recess. It seemed as though Salvador wanted to learn all he could about Rob Elementary, so that when the day came, he would be able to kill as many innocent people as he possibly could. And he used his young cousin, a student there, to get that crucial information. A monster in the truest form. In the days leading up to the shooting, it was apparent that Salvador's relationship with his grandmother had become strained. According to a neighbor named Rudy Martinez, Salvador's 66-year-old grandmother had found an AR-15 style rifle inside a duffel bag in the home, and she demanded that it and she demanded that it be removed from the house immediately. Apparently, Salvador's grandfather, Rolando Reyes, had a criminal record, so he was prohibited from having any firearms inside the house. So it wasn't just that she didn't want the rifles there, and legally couldn't have them there, but Salvador was angry with her. Instead of being grateful that she had given him a free place to live, he decided to start a screaming match with her. He would end up storming out of the house and didn't return for another three days. And when he finally came back, it was May 23rd, 2022, the day before the mass shooting. It was also on that day when Salvador messaged a 15-year-old girl from Frankfurt, Germany, named Cece. The two had met on the social media platform Ubo on May 9th. And over the next couple of weeks, they had chatted back and forth. According to CNN, Salvador would FaceTime her, and she said, He looked happy and comfortable talking to me. Cece said that he asked her a lot of questions about what it's like living in Germany. And she noted throughout their conversations that Salvador never had any friends with him, 
and that he mostly spent his free time alone on the internet. But he also mentioned some things that were concerning. Cece said that he told her he threw dead cats at people's houses. It seemed as though Salvador was comfortable with Cece. She was one of the few people that he didn't scare off. And on May 23rd, the day before the shooting, he sent her a message. I got a little secret I want to tell you. Cece tried asking what the secret was, but here was his response. Impossible for today because something is being delivered Monday 23 by 7 p.m. The message didn't really make a lot of sense. But later that day, Salvador received an order of 1,740 hollow point bullets. He now had everything he needed for the mass shooting at Robb Elementary. Sadly, in the months before the massacre, Salvador made it very clear that he was gearing up for something big, something that would, quote, make him famous. He also posted pictures of his rifles all over the internet. And when people would ask him what it was for, he would respond, quote, don't worry about it. But for others, he alluded to something much darker. He had many conversations with people that should have been reported, but they weren't. And that night, everyone in Uvalde went to bed, having no idea that their town was about to change forever. In the early morning hours of May 24th, 2022, Salvador sent a message to an Instagram model in California whom he had never met in real life. The message said, I'll text you in an hour, but you have to respond. I got a little secret I want to tell you. A week earlier, he had tagged her in a picture of his guns and asked her to share them, but she was obviously creeped out and replied, quote, I barely know you and you tagged me in a picture with some guns. It's just scary. Her message made it clear that she was not interested, but he didn't seem to get the hint. And he was dying to tell people about his sick, sadistic plans for that day. So at around 10 a.m., he FaceTimes his friend Cece, the teenager from Germany. On their hour-long FaceTime call, he showed her his outfit for the day, which was all black clothing. He also mentioned he had a secret, but he couldn't tell her until his grandfather left their house for the day. When the conversation ended, Salvador texted her with live updates on the situation. I'm gonna tell you right now, hold on. I'm waiting for this bitch. I'm gonna do something to her right now. OMG, she's on the phone with AT&T about my phone. It's annoying. What? Now that morning, Salvador and his grandma had been arguing. During his time living with her, he had been extremely disrespectful, and she was tired of it. She even threatened to remove him from her cell phone plan, and was on the phone with AT&T figuring out how to do it. But after texting Cece, saying, quote, I'ma do something to her right now, Salvador would make do on that promise. After his grandma got off the phone with AT&T, he would retrieve his gun, point it directly at her face, and pull the trigger. This very action was the start of the most horrific day the town of Uvalde had ever seen, and it had only just begun. At 11.21 a.m., Salvador texted Cece again, saying, I just shot my grandma on her head. I'm gonna go shoot up an elementary school right now. 28 seconds after receiving the text, Cece replied, cool, although she would later delete this response from her phone. She would later tell investigators that she didn't believe Salvador was being serious. And it wasn't until she saw the shooting on the news when she finally realized he was telling the truth. In a later interview, she admitted, quote, maybe I could have changed the outcome. I just could never guess that he'd actually do this, end quote. But the reality was, Salvador Ramos was telling the truth. He had shot his grandmother in the face. He then retrieved his guns and ammunition, got into his grandmother's truck, and started making his way to Robb Elementary to commit one of the worst mass shootings our country has ever seen. 
Hey everybody, it's Colin here. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of Murder in America. Now, I know a lot of people aren't going to be listening to these episodes because they're obviously really, really tough to get through and this is just such a tragedy in every single way. I mean, I can't think of something that's happened recently that was more profoundly impactful than the Uvalde shooting, but we're trying to take as much care as we can when dealing with this story. And there's just so much information about it and so many stories we have to tell that are involved in the next coming weeks. Obviously, this crime impacted Courtney and I living here in Texas. And Courtney's mom is actually an elementary school teacher here in Texas as well. So we both remember when this first happened, immediately thinking about her mom and our families. And we definitely hugged her a little bit tighter the next time that we saw her. But I want to thank a few of our new patrons this week. Jennifer DeCecco, Danny Vecchio, Melissa Rines, Caden Michael, Rose Melgal, Leslie Baca-Lopez, Savannah, Chris Watson, Madison Rain, Stephanie Aguilar, Dean Burns, Laura Griffith, Jasmine Hall, Kaylee Ogg, Jake Larson, Jacob, Chris Ponce, Cass Moreau, Sarah... at least 2042 and people in the town want it that way there are very few retail stores here right next to me is the energy employees credit union and outside there are two signs one of which says coal keeps the doors open and the other other one says coals keeps the lights on it's almost hard to go in one block here without seeing some sort of sign promoting coal defending and reminding people of coal's importance to the energy sector and, of course, to coal strip. My name is John Williams. I'm the mayor of the city of Coal Strip. Everything here is either coal or power production as a result of coal. John Williams <coughs> first moved here in 1971, when there were only a few hundred people in town. Coal strip came from the, the fact that this is this was a large strip of coal here. And uh, the story is that it was misspelled by the federal government when they put in the post office down here, and, and that's the name that it stuck with, the C-O-L-S-T-R-I-P rather than C-O-A-L. That's the story. <laughs> Mayor Williams says he was one of the first two employees who oversaw the construction of the power plant. He essentially built the town and helped incorporate it as a city in the 90s. You know, as I drive around, you can't help but see a lot of the signs that say, you know, coal keeps the lights on, yep. coal uh, keeps the doors open. Can you talk a little bit about that? It's happened because of the threat against coal, uh, the war against coal. I mean, billions of dollars within our state have been created as a result of the mining of coal. And we get a lot of benefit as a result of coal. Jobs, taxes. Together. The coal mine and the power plant are the two largest employers in the coal strip area. The jobs and the tax revenue support a first-class public school system, a nine-hole golf course, medical services, a park system, and a median household income that's 35% higher than the state average. Don't kill the goose that laid the golden egg. So that's, you know, that's my, my take on that. Right or wrong, that's how I feel. So, you know, obviously this is a community, as you've said, that is extremely dependent on one natural resource, coal. Coal. How, you know, and we talked about sort of its positive aspects, but how has this created some challenges uh, well, for the community? <clears throat> part of the challenges are that we're uh, considered to be a one-horse town, one, one industry town. And there's also, we have a number of companies, the Pacific Northwest companies, uh, are making decisions or having decisions made for them that to remove themselves from coal. What he's referring to is that for decades, Coal Strip's biggest customer for electricity was the Pacific Northwest. The Coal Strip power plant is owned by six power companies, the majority of which are based in Oregon and Washington. And now they want out of Coal Strip for what boils down to two main reasons. First, those companies are facing new climate laws requiring them to stop using coal power. Second, they say it's too expensive to run the coal-fired power plant. But there's one main stakeholder staying put in Coal Strip and buying out the other's shares, Northwestern Energy. It is the single largest electricity provider in Montana. 
I may be the only CEO in the utility industry adding coal to this portfolio. That's Northwestern CEO Brian Byrd at a meeting of state lawmakers and other officials in Montana's capital. He's announcing that Northwestern is buying out another owner in Coal Street, and for an unbeatable price. Nothing. So understand why we're doing this. We're doing this for our customers and our communities in Montana. And by the way, we're doing it for three reasons. Reliability, affordability, and sustainability. After the announcement, environmental groups blasted Northwestern's new coal strip deal. They said it had nothing to do with reliability, affordability, or sustainability. So Northwestern wants that plant to continue to operate, not because it's this great resource that it can't possibly do without. It's because that's a lot of money, and they don't want to lose it. Ann Hedges is co-director of the Montana Environmental Information Center. It's one of the state's leading environmental groups. Her organization has legally challenged coal strip stakeholders over a dozen times over pollution, rate increases, and mining expansions. Northwestern doesn't give a hoot about its customers. It is more concerned about its executive salaries and bonuses and its shareholders than it is about the people who pay the bills. The company operates as a monopoly in Montana. It profits from generating electricity and charging people for it. And it also makes money by recouping the costs of its investments from its customers. So, buying up shares and owning a bigger portion of the coal ship power plant means more money for Northwestern. This is how electric utilities operate in most states. Our main stories are like utilities, specifically electric utilities. John Oliver explained it this way on his show last week tonight. When they build something, a piece of physical infrastructure, they are allowed to then pass along that cost to you through your bill, plus an additional percentage that they get to keep as profit, usually around 10%. And this creates a clear incentive. The bigger the project, like a power plant, the more profit they make. John Oliver uses this analogy. It's like a waiter in a restaurant where there's a guaranteed tip. The more money that is spent on the meal, the more the waiter is going to make. Northwestern first bought its stake in Coal Strip in 2007 and paid around $187 million for it. But then the state approved the company's request to value their assets in the power plant at $407 million, more than double what Northwestern paid for. And since utilities get to make back their expenses, plus another 8 to 10% profit, Northwestern gets to pass the cost of the plant onto its electricity customers. In other words, as long as that plant operates for the life of the plant, which was expected to be about 2042, Northwestern will continue to collect from its customers. That's a lot of money over time. A lot of money and a lot of consequences for the environment. Here's Anne speaking on a recent webinar called What the Hell is Going On with the Coal Strip Plant? Eight to 10 million tons of greenhouse gases a year being released from that facility. If we can't solve a problem of one single plant like Coal Strip and get it on a path towards closure and replacement, um, then we, we simply can't solve our climate problem. I mean, that's, it's that simple. About an hour's drive south of Coal Strip, rancher Jeannie Alderson and her husband Terry call out to their cows. Well, we have about um, 50 mother cows, and then we have yearlings, two year olds, and a um, three year old. We butcher them about three years old, and so they just get fat on, feed them through the winter, and then in the summer they'll go out on grass. Jeannie's a fourth generation rancher. Her family's run cattle here since the 1880s. My dad's family came from the Deep South. My great-great-granddad was from Alderson, West Virginia, and he was a Baptist minister. He was an abolitionist, so he had to leave the town, and they went to Texas, and then they came up from Texas to Montana. Jeannie's family came up for the grasslands and the water. It's why they're still here today. 
She worries about the impact that coal has on the land. Toxic waste from the mine and the power plant has already harmed the water, the springs, wells, and creeks that ranchers and farmers depend on. When you mine coal and you process it through the power plants, what's left is the ash. So what they've done is they've, they, to store this ash, they've been stored in these ponds and it is getting into the groundwater. I mean, the ranchers that are around Coal Strip, it's very scary for them. According to the State Department of Environmental Quality, the coal ash ponds associated with the power plant have been leaking since their inception. Elevated levels of toxic chemicals have been found in the groundwater. Coal Strip residents have to get their drinking water pumped in from the Yellowstone River, 30 miles away. Ranching right now is hard enough, really hard to make enough money to stay in business. Since 1980, something like 40% of ranchers in this country have gone out of business. And no one is really talking about that. Like, if we any other industry, had we had that kind of loss, you would see it in the news more. I mean, and so we already are stressed to try and keep our, 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 our ranches together. The Alderson family ranch has had to adapt to the changing market. Faced with relentless pressure from large-scale beef packers offering lower prices, Jeannie and her family got creative. They invested in a herd of Wagyu cattle, a Japanese cow that produces one of the most expensive cuts of beef. They don't look like the kind of animals that, you know, most ranchers are used to, especially most ranchers in this part of the, of the, <laughs> the country. Other ranchers in the area have also adapted. But Jeannie's worried that most people in southeastern Montana aren't planning for a future that doesn't rely on coal. There's so much potential here, but the leadership in the community, the mayor, the others, they're so tied to the energy company, and I kind of feel like, you know, our leaders are just still thinking that they're, they're going to just keep going with coal. And in Helena, state lawmakers say their intention is to do just that. Coming up, coal in Montana is no different than potatoes in Ireland. I mean, that's something we got, and we've got it in spades. And that's our great equalizer, right? Jonathan heads to Montana's capital to meet with lawmakers behind the state's coal expansion. That's next on Reveal. Support for Reveal comes from Odoo. Odoo is a fully integrated suite of business applications built to help you manage your entire company from anywhere in the world. More information at odoo.com slash reveal. That's O-D-O-O dot com slash reveal. And from Progressive. Use Progressive's rate comparison tool to evaluate car insurance options in one place. More at progressive.com or 1-800-PROGRESSIVE. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Support comes from the Mayors and JCC's Jewish and Israeli Film Festival, February 3rd to 29th. Exploring a diverse, inspiring lineup of award-winning films and engaging educational programming. The Jewish and Israeli Film Festival, connecting you with others in the celebration of film and the arts. Film trailers and tickets are available at mayorsandjcc.org. From the Center for Investigative Reporting and PRX, this is Reveal on our website. My family's been in this corner of southeastern Montana for over 100 years. We celebrated our centennial year in 1986. Wally McCray is a third generation rancher. His family has raised cattle and sheep in the Cold Strip area since the 1800s. He's a cowboy poet known for his writing about life in rural Montana. Cowboys have probably always been kind of popular you know, kind of a hero figure, and maybe we fit in that. And so if people can get inside of that life through meter and rhyme, it's got a combination of appeals. This tape is from a 1988 film by Kim Shelton called Cowboy Poets. The film is from another time, but echoes many of the issues Montana ranching communities still wrestle with today. 
here while he's describing a major theme of his poetry. Because one of the largest strip mines in the United States is in my backyard, I've written several poems about the effect that coal-oriented industrialization has upon the cowboy culture. One of his poems is called The Lease Hound. It describes a coal mining agent visiting a local ranch. I've come to lease your land for coal, was how he launched his spiel. He'd been given authority to grant a generous deal. And the nation needs the coal, he said, as I am sure you know. We need more power every year to make our nation grow. And it's the patriotic duty of each American to help to get the coal mine and expedite our plan. Now, you may not like strip mining and tearing up the earth, but it's your duty, isn't it? Landmen would go to people in that big boom time in the early 70s, the way my mom described it. And they would say, everybody else around you has sold out. Why don't you sign here? There's nothing you can do. Rancher Jeannie Alderson's mom, Carolyn, was a contemporary of Wally's. She was also hearing from speculators in the mid-70s. When you're told that your patriotic duty is to step aside so they can mine this coal underneath you, um, it's insulting, it's infuriating. The speculators were there because of a report. The North Central Power Study published by the federal government in 1971. It designated Southeast Montana as, quote, a national sacrifice area for energy production. You know, Eastern Montana, this kind of dry area anyway, who's out there anyway, who really cares? Let's just turn it into the boiling room of the nation. The plan proposed building 42 coal-fired power plants, half of them in and around Coal Strip. They didn't treat us well. They lied. And they pitted one neighbor against another, and uh, it wasn't a pretty sight. And it offended us. It really did. Montana has a long history of making money by extracting its natural resources, namely copper and coal. But Carolyn, Wally, and other local ranchers didn't want to be part of that legacy. And my mom and other ranchers, they could right away see that the cost was going to be their land and water and their communities. And they were trying desperately to hold on to that. Together, they organized the Northern Plains Resource Council, a grassroots movement to protect the land in rural Montana from industrial development. I think a lot of people assume that any sort of opposition to coal-oriented industrialization was based purely on environmental grounds. I think that our concerns were more cultural or social, and finally, long-term economic. I mean, hell, we've been here 100 years. Are we going to be able to be here 100 years from now? Other environmental groups followed. They held teach-ins, staged protests, and met with lawmakers. Their actions led the state to rewriting its constitution in 1972, producing what has been called one of the most progressive constitutions in the United States. It includes language to protect the public's right to a, quote, clean and healthful environment in Montana for present and future generations. We're revisiting a story this week from Jonathan Jones. He went to the state capitol in Helena last spring to meet Montanans who say the right to a clean and healthful environment is under attack. And that attack is coming from inside the state house. In the rotunda of Montana's state capitol building in Helena, 14 year old Micah Cantor is practicing his speech. I love animals. My favorite animal is a pika. Unfortunately, they will be one of the first North American animals to go extinct because of climate change. It scares me to think that I will be Moments later, Micah is called to join a small group behind a podium. Let's get started. Welcome, everyone, to the People's House. Welcome, everyone. Hundreds of people are gathered to hear what they have to say. Welcome, everyone, to the rally to defend Montana's Constitution. <laughs> Micah gets up to speak. I'm not old enough to vote, so sometimes it is hard for me to feel like my voice is being heard. Micah stands out, not just because he's one of the youngest people here, but because he's one of 16 young people suing the state over its fossil fuel energy policies. They argue state officials are violating their constitutional right to a healthful environment. 
The clause put into the state constitution decades ago thanks to environmental activists like Wally and Jeannie's mom, Carolyn. Despite knowing about climate change and its detrimental effects for decades, the state of Montana has decided to ignore it for profit. But we have to ask ourselves if it is worth it. Is it worth it to lose the things we love? Is it worth it to lose the places that we relish? Is it worth it? All in order for more profit. At age four, Micah started worrying about the future of the world's glaciers. At nine, wildfire and smoke forced him to stay inside for six weeks and made him sick with headaches and eye irritation. At 11, a forest fire broke out about a mile from his home. Micah wrote letters to elected officials asking them to act on the changing climate. He got back a few automated responses. And so when his mom heard about an environmental lawsuit that needed young people to join and asked Micah if he was interested, it was an easy choice. We'll be the ones that have to live with the effects of climate change more than anybody else. So it's really important for me to do this. The youth-led climate trial was the first of its kind in U.S. history. In August 2023, a judge ruled in favor of Micah and his fellow plaintiffs. The court found that the state's failure, the state's failure to consider climate change when approving fossil fuel projects was unconstitutional. After the judge's decision, the state appealed. The Montana Supreme Court is now hearing the case and is expected to rule by the end of 2024. Just upstairs from the rally are the offices of the lawmakers whose actions are part of the youth climate lawsuit. Tell us who you are and what you do. Uh, Steve Fitzpatrick, uh, Senator from Great Falls, Montana, and I am the uh, Republican Senate Majority Leader. Senator Fitzpatrick is a lawyer and one of the most powerful political figures in the state. Fossil fuel companies are also some of his biggest campaign contributors. I met him before the youth climate lawsuit went to trial. You know, there's this big rally at the Rotunda at noon today, you yeah. know, and the, over this youth climate lawsuit. What is your what is your action for lawsuit? I guess I don't know anything about it. I've never read any of the pleadings. I mean, it's kind of hard for me to offer a comment on on a lawsuit where I haven't even. Well, you're a lawyer and you're getting sued by the youth of Montana over the state's climate policy. Isn't it in your interest to know what's going on? The state of Montana gets sued all the time, so uh, I don't. I, I'm a state legislator. I'm not the attorney general's office. I don't go read every lawsuit that gets filed. Fitzpatrick was elected to the state house in 2010 and then to the Senate in 2016. He is the son of John Fitzpatrick, a former lobbyist for Northwestern Energy, who is now a state representative. For the past several years, Senator Fitzpatrick has been pushing legislation to make sure the coal-fired power plant in Coal Strip stays open. And the way I look at that is that we've got a resource, we have a, a, an asset in the state of Montana, and you know, and I don't, I don't think it ought to be destroyed. We need coal, uh, and we need energy that's reliable and useful. In 2021, when the Coal Strip power plant owners based in the Pacific Northwest tried to pull out, Senator Fitzpatrick introduced a series of bills to keep them from leaving. One bill that passed imposed a $100,000 fine for every day they didn't pay their share of the operating costs. You know, to have somebody from another state reach into our state and tell us what we're supposed to do with uh, facilities and plants in our state, yeah, that's frustrating. The bills were declared unconstitutional by the courts in October 2022. But that hasn't discouraged Senator Fitzpatrick and other lawmakers from fighting to ensure the state's continued reliance on fossil fuels. During the 2023 legislative session, Republicans passed a flurry of these kinds of bills. There was a bill to limit environmental lawsuits over fossil fuel projects, a bill to add a hefty tax for charging electric vehicles, a bill to allow coal mining expansions with limited review, and a bill to weaken water quality protections for coal mine. All of these proposals were signed by the governor and became law, though some are being challenged in court. Mr. Chair, I heard the video. And then there was Senate Bill 228. Basically, this bill preemptively stops any locality from banning fossil fuels in the tools, appliances, or equipment that utilize it. Senate Bill 228 became law too, making it illegal for local governments to take action to limit fossil fuels in their cities and towns. Senator Jason Small was its primary sponsor. Coal in Montana is no different than potatoes in Ireland. I mean, that's something we got. We've got it in spades, and that's our great equalizer, right? 
Senator Small is from the Colstrip area and a member of the Northern Cheyenne tribe. There's nothing in the state financially that coal doesn't touch. That's something even some of the most remote places in the state. Uh, you know, there's some mines there, and those mines keep everybody living a good lifestyle. They're educating kids. We sprinkle coal dust all over the state. He scoffed at the notion that the coal industry's days are numbered. Oh, hell no, coal's not dead. There isn't that much reliable power out there, and the reliable power you're going to get is from gas. It's from propane, natural gas, methane. It's from coal. Those are the ones that are always going to be there when they need them. If there's one company that seems to benefit the most from these kinds of policies, it's Northwestern Energy, the largest single provider of electricity in Montana. The company finances a small army of lobbyists every legislative session. In 2023, Northwestern lobbied for bills to weaken oversight of coal mining expansions, bills increasing taxes on electric vehicles, and bills restricting solar energy. Northwestern Energy is planning to build a new $250 million natural gas plant in Laurel. The company also supported a bill that allows state regulators to approve big new capital projects, like building a new power plant without having to demonstrate it's actually the best deal for Montanans. And Northwestern supported that bill while it was building a brand new methane gas plant. The new plant started construction in 2022, and they built it on the banks of the Yellowstone River, in Steve Crumb's family's backyard. We're just south of the Yellowstone River, just south of the uh, plant location currently being built by Northwest Energy. Um, just don't understand why you build a plant like this here. Steve is a retired oil refinery worker who's lived in the area his whole life. He wasn't the only one upset about the plant. Other local residents and environmental groups opposed it since it was first announced in 2021. They say Northwestern started building before getting the proper zoning permits. This thing was being pushed as quickly and as fast as it can. They had no concern for the people here whatsoever. They had zero community meetings to get the people on board, the neighbors that live right next to them. The new gas plant is projected to emit more than 769,000 tons of greenhouse gases a year. That's equivalent to the annual emissions of nearly 170,000 cars. Concerned for his community, Steve became part of a lawsuit launched by the Sierra Club and the Montana Environmental Information Center. The suit claims the state unlawfully granted Northwestern a permit to build the gas plant because it failed to do an adequate environmental review. We all know that we got climate issues. We know that. They're using this as a step to quick money because it's the most expensive way other than coal to fire a, a generating plant to get the biggest return they can to the stockholders. In the spring of 2023, Judge Michael Moses ruled in the plaintiff's favor. He ordered Northwestern to halt construction of the gas plant. The plant was sitting half-built for months. This win was one of many for environmental groups suing the state for permitting fossil fuel expansions. The judge's ruling riled Montana's lawmakers. So what the judge did, I think, was outrageous. It flies in the face of law. It was probably one of the more atrocious pieces of judicial activism I've ever seen, and we've seen a lot of bad decisions out of this judge. That's Senator Fitzpatrick again. A few weeks after the ruling, the Republican supermajority suspended its own rules to introduce a controversial new bill at the last minute. This, this decision by the judge, it threatens every individual project in the state of Montana. This could be refineries, this could be mines, this could be anybody with an air quality permit. And we all know that each individual project is never going to change the temperature of the earth. The ruling and the lawsuit over the new gas plant were all about how the state failed to assess the environmental impacts, including greenhouse gas emissions. So the new bill would prevent state agencies from considering the potential impact of climate change altogether. Senator Small. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. So, <clears throat> House Bill 971 makes it clear that unless and until Montana policymakers enact laws to regulate carbon, a procedural review does not include a climate analysis. 
In other words, House Bill 971 explicitly prohibits all state agencies from considering climate change and greenhouse gas emissions when reviewing projects that could harm the environment. We're not going to allow endless litigation.